I'm uh, George Reed. I was elected as an MP in 1974, so I was involved very heavily in the first run at Scottish Devolution. Went to work for the International Red Cross and came back and after serving on the Government Commission for the Scottish Parliament in 2003, became the presenting officer of the Parliament. Well, I was pretty heavily involved in the 2014 campaign for Yes. Uh, I was very active, I was going up and down the country, I was doing talks, videos, plays, pretty much gave myself over to the whole thing. Uh, but that was then. The aftermath of the independence referendum needs to be discussed, the future of Holyrood needs to be discussed and obviously Brexit needs to be discussed. So we're in a different situation now. Seventy-four percent of voters backed a Scottish Parliament. Sixty-three percent supported tax-varying powers. The settled will of the Scottish people is there for all to see. Well, Donald Dewar decided it would be built at the end of the Royal Mile. I would far rather myself have seen it up in St Andrew's House, but that was lost, and when the vote is lost, you get on with what you've got. Parliament is in the British tradition to some extent, but also in the broader European international tradition. The Westminster is set apart from the people. This parliament would be with the people and it would work on the principles of openness, accessibility, accountability and the equal sharing of power. The parliament would be a parliament elected by a form of proportional representation. Uh, the parliament would, like European parliaments, sit in the round so you don't have the two swords length across uh, abuse uh, that you get in the House of Commons. Of course, Minister, because actually, sit down, precisely nothing changed. Yesterday. On the other hand, uh, members of the Scottish Parliament have only known the British tradition and they've adopted a lot of that. Uh, they could learn a bit, perhaps, from parliaments in Europe where in committees uh, people look to the national interest uh, and come together and when faced with challenges like Brexit, I would like to see MSPs here doing more of that. The building itself is extraordinarily complex, and the government at the time put in a civil servant to run it on the construction management model. A construction management model means you're building before you finish the design. Uh, that's all right in a square rectangle, but on a building like this, which is full of bendy corners, twists and turns, uh, it led to very significant construction difficulties. The delays and the cost overruns of Holyrood were enormously damaging, and the right-wing unionist press hammered it day after day after day, so that devolution itself was in jeopardy. And uh, when I became presiding officer. I didn't really expect to be Bob the Builder, but it was very clear to me that uh, unless somebody got a grip on the project, uh, the whole Scottish Parliament uh, future was in some jeopardy. And I did get a grip on it, uh, being very tough with the architects, the builders, uh, rather brutally <coughs> saying there's a cap on your money and pushing them ahead day by day. It was all rather hidden beforehand and uh, I decided one of the things to do was just once a month uh, stand up and say where we'd got to in terms of costs and progress and eventually we got there. And until we got into this building, the parliament couldn't move on. So uh, almost four years of my life went by on that. It's now history, but it was fairly rough at the time. I remember at the time the Scottish Parliament was being built it went over budget and it ran over time and there was a lot of uh, grief about that. But actually, it's a beautiful building. First of all, it's very European in flavour. So there's nothing couthy about the design. And it's very modern. Uh, there's a lot of historical materials here for tourists or, or people from Scotland to browse. And it functions as the will of the Scottish people. So, Holyrood to me means much more than the Houses of Parliament down in London ever could, which is a very old, very elitist institution. Uh, I mean, God knows how many millions they're spending on, on its upgrade. They're designed to overawe you. You're, 
you're supposed to look at the scale and majesty of it and feel sort of humbled by it, the same way that you are with a cathedral. And that's not the feeling that you get here. It's a lot more intimate. It feels a lot more uh, organic in its design. There's a lot more light, for example. You can see the outside world through it. It feels much more relevant in terms of its design to contemporary Scotland than something like the Houses of Parliament ever could. It's become the centre of Scottish democratic life and one of the things that gives me most satisfaction and pleasure is that uh, every opinion poll shows that this place is trusted by an enormous bigger majority of Scots to look after their interests than Westminster is. The future will look very different in the result of a yes vote. The future will look very different in the result of a no vote. Here's what the future will actually look like in the result of a no vote. Ahead of the referendum, the unionist parties will start talking about enhanced devolution. Strange, considering that David Cameron fought to remove Devo Max from the ballot paper. This will be then amplified by the media as a genuine enhanced devolution settlement. But yes, or for Devo Max. Well, I did a talk on St Andrew's Day 2013 in Oban, so November 2013. And at that time, everybody was talking about what would happen if Scotland voted yes. But what people weren't talking about was what would happen if Scotland voted no. And the point I was trying to make at the time was that the only threat that Scotland has ever had against Westminster, the only thing that can frighten them, the only power that we've got is the possibility that one day we might become independent. And that if we gave away that power, and we essentially gave away our strongest bargaining chip, that we would be vulnerable. Oh, it's actually between voting for separation or voting for a stronger parliament. And, I want and so the more powers idea that they were sort of floating at the time, my prediction was that it would be based on taxation uh, and that it would be based specifically on income tax rather than things like corporation tax. Um, you know, the big main levers of economic power would still be controlled by Westminster. But what they would do was give us just enough rope to hang ourselves. So that's done through income tax. So what they would say is, right, you've now got these new powers of taxation. Parliament will now be more accountable and responsible for the effects of its decisions and the resulting benefits or costs. Sounds good. OK, so your budget's going to shrink because the budget for Scotland is set by Westminster. Your budget's going to shrink. So you've either got to cut services elsewhere or you've got to raise income tax. And both of those things harm ordinary people because your average worker goes, hang on a minute, my income tax has gone up. Oh, I'm not having that. Or, well, hang on a minute, my local library's been shut because the Scottish Government have had to find somewhere else in the budget to try and offset the cuts that are coming through Westminster. Implement these uh, powers to at least ameliorate the effects of austerity from Westminster. She's coming for your paycheck. So it's a lose-lose for the Scottish Government. And they were placed in that position, obviously, because we'd voted no. And they had to accept whatever they could get. And that's exactly what happened. So the Scotland Bill that was passed uh, after the 2014 referendum, Labour pretty much fought against everything, you know, control over benefits and welfare, uh, a lot of the main levers that could help the Scottish Government can, uh, grow the Scottish economy, they were have, having none of that, so they focused on income tax and that's exactly what happens and that's why every single time now there's been some sort of cut in public services, uh, Labour are shrieking about it and calling it SNP austerity. And then you get the Tories on the other wing, if income taxes go up to say, well, Scotland's now the most highly taxed part of the UK, what do you think of that? It's a trap. That was the point. It was always going to be a trap because when we voted no, we gave away our bargaining power. And if you look at the way that things have played out since then, not only did we get the pig in a poke of uh, the Scotland bill, but now we're going to have to leave the EU, even though Scotland voted to stay. And the point about the no vote was it gave away power. It was never going to accrue power because the losers, despite what J.K. Rowling thinks, the losers don't get to dictate terms to the winners. That's obvious. And now we're in the situation where Scotland's facing uh, an EU exit that could pretty much ruin us. 
So that's the situation we're in now as a result of the no vote. Uh, we will always, as we always have done, set tax rates responsibly and with the interest of households, businesses, the wider society and economy firmly at heart. Uh, we will also not uh, simply transfer the burden of austerity onto the shoulders of those who can least afford it. But I think as we look forward over the next few years, we owe ourselves a genuine debate about what kind of society and economy we want to be. I'm a graduatist, uh, an incrementalist. I always like to put the building blicks in place, get them settled, uh, people accept it as normal, and then you go up a bit further. Uh, the real challenge, of course, is that for the first 15 years, uh, the Parliament was dependent for its money to a large extent on Westminster. Uh, now the Parliament has to raise money as well as spend money, and that's a fairly steep learning curve for people in here, but all democratic parliaments have to tax, uh, look at what they're going to tax for, and put it to the people, and then the people decide. So there are challenges, but Brexit quite clearly is the biggest. I think there are real challenges in Brexit to the economy, to the universities, to research, uh, to social security, to human rights. But there are also, you know, opportunities that uh, the more Scots see what particularly a hard Brexit would mean, the more Scots might say, hey, this is not for us. And uh, I think the government just has to be patient, uh, let opinion rise, and uh, maybe a year and a half from now, you could find people in this building uh, much more independence-minded, independence-like-minded, than uh, the London press gives us credit for at the present time. One of the other things that's happened since 2014 is that enough of the Scottish people, enough yes voters, maybe even some no voters, have recognised what's happened since then and have recognised that actually the no vote might have been a big mistake. So they've got behind uh, the idea of a second independence referendum, which obviously terrifies the Unionist Party. Can we do this again? That there, shouldn't, what, there, shouldn't, that, that there shouldn't be an independence referendum because the people of Scotland have made the decision and the overwhelming majority of people don't want it. Because but the they might well lose the next one. So they have to try and stop the referendum at all costs. Now, in 2016, the SNP ran on the manifesto of a second independence referendum if Scotland's material circumstances changed, such as Brexit against Scotland's will. That was in their manifesto. They were elected to the Scottish Parliament and with the Greens, who also favour a second independence referendum, they form a majority in the Scottish Parliament, which effectively is the democratic mechanism for another independence referendum. Now, I know a lot of no voters will say, well, why isn't the democratic result of 2014 being respected? But that's a bogus argument because, first of all, it has been respected because Scotland's still in the UK. And secondly, democracy is a process. It's not an event. It's not an event that only happens in one day and then that result in that one day invalidates any future democratic motions that are to come after that. So the Scottish people decided democratically to stay in the UK in 2014 and they've decided democratically to hold a second independence referendum. And that majority in the Scottish Parliament essentially ratified it and rubber stamped it. That has now received the majority assent of the Scottish Parliament. The result was never really in doubt as the Greens voted with the SNP. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. The First Minister can now formally ask Theresa May for an independence vote. I hope the United Kingdom government will respect the view of Parliament. This is simply about giving people in Scotland a choice. And the next step is the seeking of a, a Section 30 order from Westminster to grant the permission. Now is not the time. So can I be clear what you mean by now is not the time? Does that mean categorically no referendum, at least before a general election. The fact that we have to ask permission to hold a referendum on our own future makes the point. But they have to ask permission from Westminster. Now what's happened since then 
is that the Unionist parties in Scotland have essentially sought to deny that mandate exists. And both Kezia Dugdale and Ruth Davidson are on record, are on camera, saying that that is not a democratic mandate, that a pro-independence majority in Holyrood is not a democratic mandate, and that even if such a democratic mandate did exist, Kezia Dugdale has said that she would not respect it. So where does that leave us? Does it mean nothing that the SNP in the last Scottish election said in their manifesto that should Scotland vote to stay in the EU and the rest of the UK vote to leave, they wanted uh, uh, approval to hold another referendum, they then won that election, does that give them no mandate at all? Well, they didn't win the election. Because I'm still in the business of trying to stop a second independence referendum full stop because the people of Scotland time and time again tell me they don't want it. People who voted both yes and no want to leave those arguments of the past behind us. Okay. To tell her to take it if off the, the table. SNP and that's exactly what I intend to do. this election do as they did in 2015 and won a half of the popular vote, would that be a mandate for another referendum? Absolutely but, but not. No, not no. even if... If... The SNP publishing in their manifesto a promise to hold a, a second independence referendum then receive enough votes and enough seats to make that into a reality and we are being told that that's not a democratic mandate then what we're essentially looking at is the dissolution of democracy in Scotland because what for them is then a democratic mandate. Now even if they want to then campaign for a no vote and another referendum that's entirely fine and expected. But what they can do is deny that such a mandate exists. Now, they feel that that case has been bolstered in the general election uh, of this year, where the SNP lost seats, and they say, well, there you go, there goes the mandate for independence. But that's not how it works. But what I think we're pretty clear about is that we will have won more seats than all of the other parties combined. So I think the first point I need to make is the SNP uh, has won this election in Scotland. Nicola Sturgeon made the statement before the general election this year that if uh, the SNP won a majority of seats in Scotland in the general election in 2017, the UK election, that's a triple lock. So there's a triple lock mandate because they did win the majority of seats in Scotland in the general election. So they got enough seats from uh, the 2016 Holyrood elections. It has been passed by majority in the Scottish Parliament and they won the majority of seats in the general election in 2017 and we're being told that's not a mandate for another referendum. That is an attack on Scottish democracy. That is essentially uh, an attempt to fatally undermine, first of all, the independence movement, but Holyrood itself as the will of the Scottish people, as a mechanism for realising that will. The unionist parties are now trying to essentially pretend that whatever is passed as a majority in Holyrood, if it pertains to independence, doesn't count, and that should worry everybody. Well, I don't think there's a fundamental threat to the future of the Scottish Parliament. It's here for keeps, it's here for all time. And uh, nobody, I think, even in the deepest right-wing ranks of the Tory party, seriously would ever think about um, abolishing it. Uh, I think the problem, if you have uh, a very right-wing conservative government in London, is it's regarded not as an equal partner, but as an appendage, something that's stuck on. So, uh, on the far side of Brexit, uh, there's a danger that the European powers of this place could be displaced, that uh, workers' rights, uh, human rights, much of the powers we now have in agriculture and fishing could be diminished and there's going to be a struggle about that. If the Labour Party and the SNP uh, come together on things they're already agreed on, uh, that can probably be stopped. The problem at present is that uh, Mike Russell and uh, Nicola have had a series of meetings with the Tory administration at Westminster. They've got nothing back. So we're on a, uh, a journey with no map and we've no idea what the destination is. The game plan now, as far as the Unionist parties are concerned, is that Holyrood is sort of blown up in their face because they originally conceived the Scottish Parliament as a means of relieving the pressure um, of 
the, uh, the, the movement towards independence as a way of sort of undercutting uh, the Scottish nationalists. Um, and also as a way of managing Scotland on Westminster's behalf. Well, the people had shown they trusted themselves. Scotland does not need to choose and should not be forced to choose between separation and no change. And that's fine when you've got a unionist party in government, as we did uh, with Labour and the Lib Dems in the early years of the Holyrood Parliament. They were given certain parameters to make certain changes, but nothing too drastic, nothing too majorly structural that's going to transform Scotland and make independence seem viable. And then what happened is the SNP got into power, and that then triggered an independence referendum and has triggered a second one. And they've realised, oh no, that means the Holyrood Parliament isn't a way of managing Scotland on Westminster's behalf. It's a means for the Scottish people's will to be realised. And if the Scottish people's will is to have an independence referendum, that's a serious threat to the British establishment. So what they can do is essentially close Holyrood overnight, because that would play very badly, that's too drastic. So what they can do is gradually weaken it and undermine it, uh, devolve only so much power that it ties the Scottish Government up in knots, um, make it impossible for the Scottish Government to grow the economy, and essentially suggest to the Scottish people that a majority vote in favour of things like referenda uh, is illegitimate and somehow facile. Three hours after the Brexit vote was announced, she started talking about independence and she's been banging on about it every single day since the 24th of June. It's not about the Brexit negotiations. To turn it in the eyes of the Scottish public into a glorified council building, that's what they'll try and do. Weaken it, empty it for the inside rather than shut it down. Uh, so, for example, what's happened with Brexit is that a lot of the powers which are with the EU currently, but aren't reserved to Westminster, are going instead straight from the EU to Holyrood, are going to Westminster, and they get to decide, right, OK, we'll grant you that power, but we're keeping all of these. Um, so there's the first way in which they're undermining Holyrood. The second way is to pretend that the majority vote for a second independence referendum doesn't count. Now, it was enshrined as part of the vow that the Scottish Parliament would be legally insoluble. They couldn't dissolve it if they wanted to. That the Scottish Parliament is permanent and sovereign. But what happened as a result of Brexit is that when a challenge was mounted to uh, the UK government vis-a-vis -vis Scotland's part of the whole Brexit thing. You know, Scotland voted to stay, the rest of the UK apart from um, Northern Ireland voted to leave. So the Scottish government are petitioning Westminster for a recognition of that. It goes to the Supreme Court. On the devolution issues, the court unanimously rules that UK ministers are not legally compelled to consult the devolved legislatures before triggering Article 50. The devolution statutes were enacted on the assumption that the UK would be a member of the EU, but they do not require it. And the Supreme Court and the UK decide, no, no, no. The Scottish Parliament is sovereign to Westminster. Whatever decision Westminster takes on behalf of the Scottish Parliament is legally watertight. So actually that idea that the rights of Holyrood and the permanence of Holyrood are legally enshrined in law has been shown up. So that key tenet of the vow that we were promised before the vote has been shown up as being empty rhetoric. That it has no real way of um, being defended in law by a Scottish government because the that what's known as the Seoul Convention, uh, which is the, the permanence of Holyrood, has been exposed by the ruling by the Supreme Court that Westminster can basically do what the hell they like to us. Now, in 2014, the no vote was never going to be interpreted by the British establishment as Scotland demonstrating its trust and its faith in Britain. 
they were going to interpret that as us demonstrating our vulnerability and our weakness. And they were always going to take advantage of that because that's what the British establishment does. And essentially the question was asked of Scotland, do we trust ourselves to be able to run and manage our own affairs? Or do we trust a British elite which time and time again has shown that it doesn't care the first thing about Scotland's needs? And that's been demonstrated in numerous ways after the 2014 vote. So all the promises about uh, shipyard jobs and renewable energy um, and steelwork, these jobs are under threat if Scotland votes yes. Well, what's happened? The amount of frigates that was promised uh, to the Glasgow shipyards has been reduced. The subsidies for uh, renewable energy has been cut. Steelworks, we're told that there'd be, uh, there'd be a loss of HMRC jobs. They've gone. So the promises that were made in 2014 by the No campaign have been fundamentally exposed as being hollow. And we can't be fooled again, especially given the calamity of Brexit that's about to unfold before us. At this time, more than anything else, this country needs a period of stability. One of the most fundamental problems with this bill is what it amounts to, yes, a power grab by this government. This is a blank, undemocratic check, which, if passed, gives unprecedented powers to this government. If Scotland had voted to stay um, outside of the European Union along with the rest of the UK, fair enough. But Scotland didn't vote in that direction. Scotland voted to stay in Europe. And what's going to happen is going to completely change the complexion of Scotland. I mean, here we are in Edinburgh in August. Can you imagine Edinburgh without Europeans in it? It's inconceivable. What will happen to Scotland culturally, economically, the whole infrastructure of the UK is going to change and the Tories are going to reshape it in their own image in all sorts of ways. So the NHS will be opened up to privatisation as part of a trade deal with Donald Trump. Uh, they'll further erode workers' rights, all the things that the European Union were protecting and that affect Scottish workers and British workers uh, across the land. But what should concern us as part of Scottish democracy is that when Scotland has left the EU, if we tried to exercise the mandate that we already have for a second referendum and they simply say, no, well, what can we do about it? How do we appeal to a higher international court? We're no part of Europe anymore. We need the backing of Europe in order to be able to protect Scottish democracy. Because Westminster isn't suddenly going to go, right, OK, we're out of Europe, we're going to grant all your wishes and do what you want. You know, they're going to say, actually, we're going to grant none of your wishes and we're going to do none of what you want. It doesn't matter how you vote in your re-pretended parliament. We're in charge. It's enshrined in law. The Supreme Court have validated us. We can do whatever you want to your parliament. Any economic good news story for Scotland is bad news for the union because it proves the viability of independence. So they'll make damn sure that Scotland does not have the chance to economically ever thrive, even within the union because it would put us in a position where we would see independence as being viable. So even if we stay in the Union, it's curtains for Scotland. It's curtains for Scotland because of Brexit, and it's curtains for Scotland because the Tories will weaken us to the point where we'd be simply unable to become independent. And that's where it's going. Uh, I think the more Scots see what's being lost uh, through a hard Brexit, uh, the more they will say, you know, this, this sort of Tory, right-wing, imperialist, buccaneers of the world approach is not for us. It's not the sort of society we want to live in. We want to live in something much more like Scandinavia, uh, which is inclusive, where we pay a bit more tax for health service, for education, etc. And uh, at the end of the day, we're comfortable in our skin, that great French phrase, confortable dans sa peau, uh, like the Danes, who like being Danes, don't have any vast worldwide ambitions, look after their people, uh, earn a good wage rate, uh, see their children go through good schools and universities, and are aware that the health service is available for them. That, that's the sort of Nordic Scotland I would like to see. 
little countries know how to share power. And purely personally, uh, I feel Scots, I feel European. Um, that's where I'd like this country's future to be and the future for my children and my grandchildren. So even if you oppose independence, what I don't understand is why Scots would fight against giving themselves the choice at the end of the Brexit process, when it's clear what the deal is going to be, why we would fight against giving ourselves the choice of rejecting or accepting that deal. Because the English people who voted Remain don't have that veto. 49% of people in England would be desperate for the chance to escape Brexit. Desperate for it. And we've got the chance to escape Brexit. And there are Scots out there saying, or oh, let's not have another independence referendum because I might be at a dinner party where I might have to disagree with somebody. Or let's not have another independence referendum because I might have to walk five minutes down the road to put another cross in a box. What we're looking at here is the future destruction of what we have in Scotland. The hard-won freedoms that we have in Scotland can all be taken away from us. Because if we vote no again, or if we don't have another independence referendum again, we have got nothing to bargain with. We are powerless. And I, for one, don't want that to be my future or the future of my child.